Hell yeah. Ooh. We are live. Today I have Phil Gigstad with me, a brother whom I served with back in 2008 and 2009. And I have returning guest, Tyler Pollock. It's good to have both of you on tonight, man. Thank you for coming out, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having us. Hell yeah. So, so back to, so essentially this. So if you were to really unpack what the Marine Corps is doctrinally. Our ethical system is what you would call Aristotelian, right? Everything is virtue ethics based. And so you take JJ De Tybuckle, for example. So by justice, judgment, um, uh, initiative, determination, all that stuff are virtues, virtues that were essentially taken from an Aristotelian, uh, uh, golden mean, excessive def deficient um, model. And if you look at the Marine Corps traits and principles, like the 11 Marine Corps traits and principles, a lot of it has to deal with context, uh, situation-based uh, uh, circumstances. A lot of it has to deal with habituation, conditioning the body to respond to the right things. And if you look at Aristotle's format, uh, Aristotle, going back all the way to uh, King Philip of Macedon, brought on uh, Aristotle to teach young Alexander his school of thought. And the claims that I was making when I was talking to you, uh, Pollock, was there is a suggestion in his history that somehow Alexander may have also taught you know, the Greek hoplites, this indoctrination process. And as we already know through the historical record that male-on-male -male relationships were one of the foundational structures of being a better warfighter, we can assume or we can suggest that this process of Aristotelian virtue ethics was responsible for what I call uh, psychical abilities to manifest themselves in the battle space. Essentially, the idea that the existence of the other, along with a series of speech acts and diction, create atmospheres that your brain can process and then pick up. And so we view the body as an antenna and, a, and it can receive and transmit information. And all of this is viable. All of this has been done. We did it through the tactical profiling, um, MCDP uh, portions. Uh, they transformed it into the Combat Hunter Program. Then they created a hybrid program called Border Hunter Program. And then currently today, it's splintered into two domains. One of them is known as Kodiak, which is uh, it's like counter operations and irregular warfare, something like that. And then there's a subset. And I recently found out through, uh, through a, a Marine uh, back, on a, back in 1st uh, Marine Division that they're not teaching the Combat Hunter program anymore, hmm. that they're doing away with it, among other things. Hmm. And, and, so, and so the point that I'm making with all of this is that there is some 
there is some institutional reality, some, some properties within institutional reality that allow certain abilities to manifest. But the further we digress or the further we go away from this kind of human dimension, these kinds of philosophical properties, these religious properties, that we end up losing it, thus the decision-making process along with the other unknown capabilities that the mind has begins to lose this kind of edge on the battle space and within, you know, just regular garrison life. And so we already have pre-existing issues. And if those pre-existing issues become, you know, exploited and then with a, a decadent ethical system and a procedural mechanical system, then we're never going to make it out of the, the decline. And thus we're going to see, you know, what I call entropic traje trajectories where everything becomes less and less organized. So yeah, and that's my, that's, not, that's my nice way or my, my easy way of saying that, look, every human being on this planet has the ability to manifest psi abilities. Everyone's psychic to some extent. We call it premonitions of precognition. And uh, it's a little out there. And, you know, my suggestion was this. The body understands when you're in a controlled environment. And thus, it's not going to respond accordingly to whatever experiment is taking place. And that the only way to really get the real data is to do this in real-time operations. And so I want to fucking set up a, a bona fide experiment that's ethical, that doesn't compromise the operators, that doesn't compromise the unit to extract the biofeedback from guys operating on the ground to see if there are any discrepancies along with the administration to vet the information or the psychophysiological effects of the individual. So for example, if you're on a patrol, you get the gut feeling and you feel something bad's going to happen, you know, how is the body responding to that? And I'm sure we can aggregate some information from that, but in real time. So that's something that we need to do, not we, but if we really want to take telepathy as a real phenomena, and it is a real phenomena, a step further, then we need to step out of the control lab, laboratory setting and move into real-time ops. But the problem is scientists aren't going to go into the battle space to do that. Yeah. So how far into this have you started to kind of define your operational def uh, definitions and constructs of how you would measure that? I have, um, I have very rudimentary things. Um, what I was waiting for, and I think, you know, so one of the ethical components to this was, all right, so there is a possibility that data or some kind of a server could get breached. And if you were able to breach a, you know, a, a mainframe and obtain the biofeedback information from a particular unit, then you can use that against them, whether it's through forecasting or whether it's actually identifying them on the battle space and we know that the drone capabilities today are very, very good. We know that China has developed capabilities that could monitor uh, specific kinds of, you know, biofields, can identify you from far away using their technology. And so we have to somehow encrypt the information that's being aggregated. And where we store it also has to be um, fortified somehow away from breaches. And so that's one aspect of it. And, you know, this is one of the deficiencies that I have is I don't have the software language to try to do something like that. You know what I mean? So crypt, you know, block, uh, blockchain technology might be one of those. There's some early startups, but they're very, very expensive, but they still pose a threat. Um, I spoke with uh, an individual um, within uh, the MARSOC community. They're trying to come up with their own program to kind of measure these kinds of things. Um, but once again, you're, you're, you're treading a line 
where if one of these systems gets breached, then the individuals get compromised. And this has happened already. Um, and I think 2014, the Office of Personnel Management, which had 22 million records, had all these intelligence um, operatives within their mainframe and all their identities got compromised. And, so, and I think it was North Korea that did that attack. And so when you have a breach like that, you know, anyone who's in operations has to like come back and change everything. And it's a very big process to deal with when it's, you know, monetarily, operationally, um, poses a lot of threats. So it's very, very rudimentary, man. Gotcha. Yeah, it's it's uh, pretty intricate to try to figure out how to administer that and um, bring something to the table for um, research because a lot of a lot of the people that you're going to be presenting to through IRB aren't going to have a whole lot of experience with what you're even talking about. Oh yeah, um, it's going to take a ton of time and, and real finesse speak to get the point across of how to actually accomplish something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so right now it just remains uh, kind of like in a dream state for me that gotcha. one day we'll be able to do that. But there are other ways that we can do that. And that's kind of my hope with um, how, what I call agrotherapy, that we could actually do this in a, in a normal environment, but within a uh, agricultural based uh, environment. And there is a therapeutic component to it. So one of the biggest uh, critiques and kind of analysis that I want to share with uh, the American public is, is this idea of hyper-reality. It seems that today we don't understand what is real and what is not real. And, you know, we can take things like Walt Disney, for example, like Mickey Mouse, that's, simu that's a simulacrum, right? That's a, that's a fake concept, but in a real time situation. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of real, but then there's this also mediated stuff where you can't trust information these days because you don't know where it came from or whether it's from a foreign power. And so we're presented with this huge challenge that we can't escape hyper-reality because technology is highly entangled and our roles and our identities. So we have to make it compatible with how we use and implement mental health within our everyday structures. And there is a way we can do it. And I'm trying to come up with this biofeedback device, a series of rituals and a system in which individuals can come out of the darkness and live fulfilling and flourishing lives regardless of the climate, regardless of what's going on. And, you know, I was telling Paul, man, about a year ago, man, I was in a, a really bad, dark place. I'm like, I was like in spiritual warfare mode, dude. And, you know, what I got from it was something was happening that was preparing me for this moment in time. And, essentially what I got out of it, I created these models, these models of mental health, and I call it mental health sense making. And I started to incorporate them in my life. And surely, but slowly, I came out of the darkness. You know, I was reflecting all these like, influence and informational, these kinds of memetics and, and narratives, I was like deflecting them, you know, it wasn't bothering me, it wasn't affecting me. You know, a lot of people went through a hard time, these past eight months, and a lot of it was they just weren't prepared for what Russia, what China, what North Korea, or what Iran was doing to our information ecology. And they essentially sowed division to the point where now it's, you got these, what I call pathogenic meme plex, these kinds of cultural bits of information that have these connotations. So if you're fucking white, you know, that has a negative aspect to it, right? Right. I mean, it's not your fault that you were born that way. It's not my fault that I was born Mexican, you know? 
Um, but also, this plays on to the continual and perpetual ethical decline that we find ourselves in. And what I mean by that is somehow we've, we've taken a standard of judgment of life, and it's increasingly become less and less and less. And now we have this highly individualized state. And this was, you know, what Paula was saying the last time is that everything's so individualized that this idea of being an atom or even trying to approach life as a cohesive unit is impossible because we don't know what the hell that means or what that is. And so we live in our day-to-day -day lives alienated and isolated and there is no shared experience or reality. Oh, yeah. And I mean, that's manifested everywhere. You walk out, you can walk out your front door and go to the store, or sit in the doctor's office or whatever, and everybody's glued straight to their phone, to whatever it is there. You can't even hardly have a conversation in person in public anymore um, because people are in, live in this virtual world that only sort of exists. Yeah, the spectacle. I call it the spectacle, man. Um, Guy Debord wrote a book, I think in the late 60s, called The Society of the Spectacle. And essentially it was how commodification, consumerism, um, the increasing technologies were going to create this kind of spectacular where essentially the substance of life was going to somehow diminish and everything was going to be about imagery. And there is a kind of component to that that really exists today. And all you have to do is go on Instagram and you see like all these people with the perfect bodies. And it's just like, <laughs> that's not reality. Um, um, so it's, you know, <laughs> it's crazy, man, how, how far we've come in just the past decade with yeah. everything. Yeah, see, my, I, I kind of pride myself to be the opposite of that. We have, uh, we have uh, some property in South Alabama over here and there's no cell service, no internet, no nothing out there. And I love it because I can put the phone down. I don't have to hear anything. And I'm in the moment with the people that I'm there with oh, and wow. really live those experiences. Yeah. Uh, Bruce Schneer wrote a book called Data and Goliath. And Data and Goliath, man, if you haven't read it, it was written in 2015. Um, but he, he talks a good bit about how in society, we've been coerced uh, tacitly to comply with big data, big tech. And essentially, if you want to survive in this market, if you want to survive and keep up with the Joneses or keep up with any kind of information, even your freaking news, guess what? <laughs> you have to somehow make an email and get on these social media sites to receive the information. And it's like, you have no other choice. And I think that's very, very dangerous. It's dangerous on, on one aspect because you're not given much of a choice, which that that's not freedom. And then two, you fall victim to potential independent sources of information that you know may not be vetted, which kind of creates another issue. So the QAnon movement, you know, they have like all these alt-right, alt-left movements. Um, the gamification of politics or the gamification of conspiracy theories. You know, conspiracy theories provide uh, a sense of comfort, um, in essence, in response to a very tragic accident or a very tragic uh, moment in our, in our history. And it's easier to put blame behind very big events to a very big person or entity. And so, you know, the further we individualize and the further we create these kinds of narratives, we you know people who have pre-existing vulnerabilities who may feel alienated just get kind of sucked into this. And it also presents a national security issue. It's not terrorism that we have to worry about. It's people who get sucked into the conspiracies that then uh, act on it. And I think, I don't know if I told you, uh, Paul, the last time how in the UK uh, in 2019, 
in Twitter, they were disseminating 5G conspiracy theories and people in the UK responded by burning down cell towers. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you essentially burn down, you know, cell phone towers, you're cutting out communications, the logistics, the medical supplies, uh, law enforcement, whatever. And, and so you have this highly decentralized um, network of agency taking place and law enforcement and the intel community isn't on par with the increasing fast paced changes right the most and like you can take like swatting for example <laughs> you know you <laughs> you yeah. can go on google and you can look up someone's address and if you know they piss you off to the point i'll just i'll just call 911 on this dude and say he's he's about to harm the public and yeah, then that's uh, fucking insane that's insane. That I mean, that have that's happened to several people. I mean, people have been killed that way. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you know. We kind of talked about the these conspiracies the last time and how we can go pretty deep into those. But I mean, so you know, to me, a lot of us know this that you know one of the, one of the easiest ways to control a population or control any any you know human being or living thing that's able to process information is with fear. Um, and, you know, that, that drives a lot of people, you know, with these social media platforms and everything to constantly stay glued to them because they're worried, you know, am I going to have a job next week is, you know, are we going to drop bombs on another country, you know, this virus stuff and everything. So they just want to constantly stay updated with it. But in the meantime, they don't realize that what they're, all the all the other information that they're subjecting themselves to that maybe they don't even want to necessarily see but by going to these sources to get this information you're opening yourself up to be you know compromised you know in whatever other way that that they want to that's a perfect example of that is being on instagram and seeing fucking these ads that i don't you know i don't follow any of this shit but i'm seeing like you know, tool shit. I'm a, I'm a fucking tool guy and shit, you know, and I'm seeing like tool ads and I've like never seen this shit before. Don't think about it. Keep scrolling. And then fucking I'm in bed, you know, a few days later and I'm like fucking looking up what this trying to look up this. <laughs> yeah. Talk. So I'm like, Oh, that was sick. I want that shit. <laughs> like that's just advertising. That's, that's, I didn't want to see this, but because I was on there trying to see pictures of my buddies or whatever, you know, see, see what they're doing. I'm seeing this other shit that's getting implanted in my head. And now, you know, I I'm living with that. So, um, and, and like you were kind of touching on earlier about the whole, you know, nothing fat to me right now, facts don't exist the way that we get information. Everybody has their own personal belief system and you're going to align you know, with, with whatever info information you're going to agree with what inf ever information aligns with your beliefs and your thought processes. It doesn't matter if it's real or not. You're just going to agree with that. And then whoever disagrees with you, whether you know them in person or not, you're going to argue those facts that you just, or not facts, that information that you just received, whether it's facts or not, it almost doesn't matter at this point. And now it's so difficult to even try to vet that information or verify it by searching different sources, just to try to find, you know, a, uh, you know, the truth in it all. You know, I was talking to my wife in bed last night. We were watching, uh, I forget what the fuck we were watching. We watched some shit about the election and, and all this. And, uh, you know, it, it just got to the point where I was like, search. I was like, just try to search this on your phone, on Google. Uh, Trump, the, like the, you know, this, this um, idea that, you know, voting machines were tampered with or whatever, the software and all this. You can't even Google search that right now. Like you have to scroll for pages and pages to even find links to articles that are discussing this. It's not being talked about. And, and I'm not saying I agree with this or, you know, I've tried to remove myself from politics for the most part, but it's just like, to me, that's a scary thing that when you can't, you're certain, you want to try and find out if there's information, but there's people controlling what information, whether it's facts or not, is being released to the public. This is a huge concern, you know. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just we're we're go we're on this slippery slope right now of of you know where we're headed as far as what people are able to 
to inform themselves on and in what way they do it. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, I, before, before we get into the meat and potatoes, um, I just got off. A, I was in a meeting earlier, um, kind of a consultation talking about uh, narratives, mimetics, um, the gamification of things and uh, what I call the metal war paradigm. And, and, and like you said, it's a very difficult thing to vet information. Um, if you look on social, uh, on uh, Instagram right now, they're not allowing hashtags to take place because they're still trying to figure out what's going on with, you know, the election, the election fraud that has taken place or hasn't taken place. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of um, kind of intermediary news components and social media platforms. And you know that those media platforms are going to be the breeding grounds to an even bigger issue in the United States. And that means crazy types of ideas and memes, kind of like the whole QAnon movement. And so for me, the greatest national security concern, and I said it the last time, is social, epigenetic, and mimetic entropy. And we're headed toward this kind of lesser organization that is going to create this docile population that's going to be susceptible to all sorts of deviant things. And, you know, in order to really stop that, it begins with working with children, creating sense-making tools, educating the public objectively, unbiased, and I know we have biases. And how we do that is we use the current tools being used against us with narratives and mimetics to counter and co-opt those deviant narratives being used against us. But it takes a literal whole of society effort to really uh, do that. And it's a very challenging thing because we're only, right now we're just reactive. And this is, this is part of the consciousness of the population and how we've managed you know, war and warfare through a kinetics-based approach. And it's not like that no more. Yeah. What was the thing you were saying last time about? I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that again, about the, the study that was done on like, uh, you said it was like 16 to 20 some year olds about how their, you know, IQs are too low and touch on that again. If you, if you. Yeah. So the Pentagon, I think the Pentagon did a study in 2018 and they, re I think there was another article that was pushed out by DOD. And it's on their website. You can go on the Pentagon and look it up. And I think out of, man, I want to say out of the 40 million um, young adults at that time period, which were people from 19 to 24, mm -hmm. uh, these individuals uh, were vetted. And the tests that they did were, uh, I, I'm assuming they aggregated data set points that looked into whether they were obese or over overweight mm -hmm. and their IQ scores. Right. And they found out that of these like 40 million people in the United States, only 60% or 60% of those people could not serve in any capacity whatsoever. Wow. Yeah, that's disgusting. I mean, that's terrible. Yeah. That's terrible. <laughs> it's crazy. It's crazy because, you know, you know, even if you were to just to work a desk job, the amount of, you know, work that you had to put into your body in order to maintain you know, proper mental health, uh, proper stability within your relationships, how you approach your coworkers. There's so much work that has to be put into that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a citizen, if you're not capable, if you're, you're malnutrient, if you have health problems and you have stress problems, well, guess what? Then the organization or the company and your coworkers, every aspect is, that intersects with you is going to be affected. Right. So, so yeah, that was the, uh, that was the DOD report that got put out. And then on top of that, uh, sadly, we've created a military uh, warrior case system where the military um, is increasingly become detached from the American population. And this is dangerous because one, we put the all volunteer force into questionable conflicts 
that the American public is detached from. We pose a greater threat in terms of a military becoming politically leaning instead of remaining apolitical, right? And we can look at the, the Romans, the 30 year Romans war where every freaking year a Roman army and a new general came in to take, take over Rome. And, you know, this is a part of our, our, uh, our deteriorating uh, na national identity. You know, I, you know, what does it mean to be an American? Well, I don't know what it means to be an American, but I know what it means to be a U.S. Marine. I know how to utilize, you know, the ethical doctrinal components and apply that to my life to be a good citizen. And to me, because the Marine Corps was a part of the American, you know, way of life, to me, that's American. And yeah, I'm still going to acknowledge the fact that I'm a Mexican. You know, I can't deny that. And, you know, I make the best of both worlds. Um, and I look at my place and I think if I was born anywhere else, man, I would not have the same opportunities that I have today. Right. For sure. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, so li life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, you know, anybody that's not that's not uh, defined by borders. No, you know, any anyone can. Achieve that. Well, not anyone, but I get what you're saying. You know, other countries go to other countries and see if they have that, see if they even have that philosophy. Yeah. I guarantee you most of them don't. Um, but yeah, we're spoiled here. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people don't know that, <laughs> you know, maybe due to their exposures, but it's, yeah, it's crazy. It is. It's a wild thing. So, Doc. Yeah. It's been what, 10 years? Oh, at least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was telling Polly, man, it's, it's so hard to put 11 years into like two hours. <laughs> oh, man. I tell you, I listened to your first talk and it was unreal because like I don't really um, keep in touch with too many of the guys. You know, I, I talk to Danny on occasion um, and every once in a while, you know, Timmy and I'll text back and forth, but beyond that, like I really don't talk to anybody. And I was listening to y'all talk, man. It's like I'm, I got a, I do a lot of hiking. I got a trail by my house. It's like four miles, and I was on it. And I found myself laughing out loud with y'all, like we were just back. It's <laughs> like you know breaking bread and just bullshitting, and it was awesome. It made yeah. it like like it was just yesterday, and we were here together right now having this conversation. And I was just listening to y'all. Yeah, hell yeah. Dude, yeah, it was weird when uh, her hit me up to do it. I was just saying, you know, I've never done shit like that before. I've never really talked, you know, at length about anything like that with, with anyone. And even him, I haven't talked to him in 10 years besides messaging back and forth on, you know, some posts and shit or whatever. But, yeah, it's it's just crazy and it's good. And I do think, you know, we talked a little bit after it was out and everything and getting hit up by guys and everything just saying damn good to hear you guys and it's just like man maybe that that is maybe this is good for people just to listen to it's not like if you don't want to you know say have anything to say that's fine too but just like you just said you know you're just listening to it and you should you know it's just i think it's good for a lot of people just to hear that you know we're we're, we're we've moved on in life and kind of you know still appreciate each other deeply, but you know, it's just good to hear that people are doing good. Oh yeah. There's a therapeutic element to it for sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, we, none of us want to hear that we're suffering. Right. You know? So if we can hear that a couple of the guys and it makes you feel like you're there with them. And then you hear, you know, that like, I mean, here's my first roommate in the Marine Corps. <laughs> 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 you know, he kind of, he kind of got me schooled up and like trained up like, what the hell I'm supposed to be doing and how I'm supposed to act and everything. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I have a good, I have a good buddy. I used to ride like freestyle BMX when I was younger and a good buddy of mine uh, lived down in Charlotte, a little bit South of me, but he, he uh, ended up being a corpsman and he was in Sangin in 2011. And um, I text him all the time on Instagram and whatever, just bullshit and stuff. But um he was a bad boy, like new as shit. And I always, like I was telling him a couple weeks back, I was just like, man, I, I fucking like loved, I loved my Corman. And 
even mm-hmm. even more than most of the Marines. The, I don't want to say they're shitty and good Marines. They're shitty and good corpsmen. Like yeah. the good, the good fucking corpsmen. I was telling them, I was like, dude, like when you you were on, you're thinking about this, and I was like, damn, you know, I didn't ask him anything about it, but I was just like, man, I can't imagine what it what the thought press process is like when you decide you want to be a fucking greenside corpsman <laughs> or like do you even do you even gain how this works i never really understood the process of like when you join the navy and then how you get to being in okay. a yeah let's community. unpack that so yeah. for me my personal experience um when i joined i uh my parents were like yeah you should talk to the navy because it'll be like it'll be safer for you I was like, okay, yeah, that worked. <laughs> like, I just want to go over there and like blow shit up and stuff, you know? Yeah. And so um, I walked into the recruiter's office and I talked to them and they were like, uh, yeah, man, you could go. We have Navy EOD and we have like the boat guys and the SEAL teams and all this stuff. And I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, well, sign me up for that. How do I do that job? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you got to go do the, do the NDOC and everything. And um, I did it. I passed it. I blew it out of the water. But uh, my vision, once I did the vision exam, they were, um, yeah, man, you're blind, dude. You can't see. Like, you you join the Navy, but you can't do this job. Right. They were like, we got to find you something else. And so I told the recruiter, I was like, look, I want to go and be on a boat. I don't want to be on a ship. I don't want to sit up at some Navy base, you know, doing. and he's like, oh, look, you could go be a corpsman and serve with the Marine Corps. They don't have any medical people. I was like, <laughs> yeah, dude, sign me up. That's, that's what needs to happen. And so I got that billet um, through my contract while I was in um, the debt program. Mm-hmm. Then I went through boot camp. And then um, because of the time frame that we all joined uh, and there was heavy conflict going on, it was like, a, and then especially with Obama wanting to push through southern Afghanistan and take that like seventy percent of us from my core school class went FMSS field med orders going straight to the Marine Corps afterwards and like yeah. I was actually in um, getting ready to graduate from FMSS school and in Lejeune and they were like yep you're gonna go to two eight and y'all are deploying to Iraq in like a month I was like wait I graduated <laughs> in three weeks and then a week to go to Iraq. <laughs> I was yeah. like, hey, I'm calling my mom and dad, you know, like, Hey, like this is going to go on. This is what's happening. And they're like freaking out. Like, Oh, we thought you were going to you know, be on this boat and like, you know, be living safe in the Navy. Right. Um, so yeah, for me and I, you know, they also give you like the little dream sheet while you're in uh, field med training. And so you get to sign up. And so like, I had known some guys that did uh, what we call PSI duty, which is like an interim duty between um, your core school training and your field training. And so like I did it at headquarters battalion, which was super cush, uh, second Marine division. Yeah. But then I had friends that were at like uh, three, nine and three, two. And they were like, yeah, man, you got to come to, you got to go to the infantry battalion. So like I put down three, nine, three, two, and a couple other ones that I knew Mm -hmm. people. Then I ended up getting um, selected for two eight, which was awesome. <laughs> so was there like so so you kind of got to like you say make your dream sheet of of where you would like to go? Did any guys like that did not want to be infantry corpsmen end up getting sent to infantry units too? Is, oh yeah, is, yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't they don't give a shit what you want really, but yeah, no, they know. did they, they put you down, but they 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 were like, okay, great, you do want to go, awesome, you're definitely going. right. Yeah. Want to go back to uh, uh, blue side? Sorry, you're going to three two. Yeah, one eight, right. two eight. You know, and they kick you out over there. So. Yeah. So but, I got a I got a question for you real quick. Yeah. And this applies to you, Polly. How do you feel that your MOSs are now gone? Yeah, that's kind of weird too, because like he was saying about you know. Um, uh, your dream sheet shit. Well, like when, you know, when you're, when we were in, uh, ITB, you know, infantry training battalion, everybody's getting trained up on the basic, you know, weapon systems and all that. And then you kind of decide most of the big fuckers end up being machine gunners. Like that's just, (laughs) that's just what the instructor, they went and picked around. You're like, you're a machine gunner, you're a machine gunner. But then you get guys like, no offense. I love this man. 
Westra, one of the smaller guys in the whole fucking company, <laughs> they make his ass a machine gunner, and he was a badass machine gunner. Right. But he, just because they want to haze this little man, make him carry <laughs> fucking fifty cal. But, uh, but yeah, he was a bad boy. But I mean, I kind of i I got to pick my job to be an assault man, and a fucking honestly, it was probably it's probably the the best infantry job in the world because you do pretty much all the 11 shit you're with the weapons guys you get to learn all that that shit too like i used to do gun drills with the mortar men all the time loved it i love mortars but like i was just like i want to blow shit up too i was a big pyro still kind of am a fucking pyro as <laughs> you know it was a kid and shit so i'm like making i used to make dude i used to make fucking i don't even know if i should be saying this but i used to take like fireworks you know, because they can only be like 500 grams of black powder. That's the cab, at least in North Carolina. And I'm like, fucking, you know, making modded out fireworks and like doing all <laughs> as a kid. And I'm like, dude. So um, they're like, oh, yeah, you can shoot rockets and fucking, you know, fuck with demo and like do all this. And it was I loved it. But I am sad. They just they just they they didn't they they got rid of fucking Corman. Pretty sure that they were doing away with the MOS. Holy like shit! Eighty four oh four, like the field, field. That's so what they replacing it? What are they gonna? What are they gonna do? What's the Marine Corps doing? Are they doing like Army, where you just have like me, like medics that are that are Marines? I have no idea. It's something that I haven't looked into okay. entirely, but I know that they were doing away with a lot of it. I mean, they recently just did away with tank divisions. Um. Right. Yeah, I so, saw that. I heard about that. Yeah, and, so I mean, as far as my job goes, like I'm sad that my MOS went away, but I completely understand it. I mean, you guys knew all the 51s that we deployed with in, in fucking 09, and I'm sure 11 was a very similar scenario. Like, yeah, I, dude, I feel so privileged that I got to do some of the shit I did. Like, we emplaced Claymores and fucking made grape shot charges which are ammo cans full of brass and link and lined with c4 at the bottom blew those when bridge one was getting hit up like fuck i don't know if anybody was in the tree line but that was their you know egress route so we're like tattoo you know hit that clacker when they're running by but maybe catch somebody with something but like i got to honestly got to shoot you know combat rockets the small and the law in country, which fucking very few people do. Now, you know, it's just, I got spoiled. So, um, but I thought my job was pretty much at that time, even like obsolete. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing that a, an 11 couldn't do. If, you know, they were, there's a lot of math with the demo shit. You gotta be pretty smart, but, um, you know, we, we used to go to the engineer, um, the engineer fucking ranges to do all of our shit. Like these engineers, combat engineers are already doing the shit. They just weren't as well versed on the small, um, which that weapon systems kind of needs to be phased out anyway. There's, there's a lot more practical things, but as you guys know, you know, the small was rarely even taken out on patrol. You know, everybody was back in laws because anybody with a, with a weapon system, you know, the two forties, the fucking heavy weapon systems, those guys are, are the first guys targeted in ambushes or anything because they know you're packing a punch. So we just ran with the laws, which is a, you know, a rifle squad weapon system, you know. Um, so, but yeah, it kind of needed to go. I, I don't think they should do away with all of the training because I think it's some of that, some of that shit's important and very practical like i know the guys that were with with first platoon in 09 uh you know they were making those improvised line charges not like the big mig uh mick licks or or uh, apobs i mean that you know route clearance was using to detonate some of those ieds like the stage brothers i know and and rash and them were making these c4 ropes that if you needed to cross a roadway and didn't have a sweeper or whatnot, you could just throw that line charge up on the road, mm -hmm. detonate it just to cause sympathetic detonation. If, if there were any in place bombs, detonate them. And then, you know, you got a clear lane to cross the, the, uh, the road. So I do think certain things like that, at least in that, that situation in, in Afghanistan were, you know, th that was pretty smart on them. Um, to do that and be able to 
implement that. But if you completely take those capabilities away, unless you have combat engineers with you or someone, it's like you can't, you don't have that option. Uh, so, but yeah, it's sad to see it go, but I still love, still love my weapons guys and all that. But I actually was talking to a guy from Fox Company 28. Um, he was a mortarman. He's in right now. I don't know anyone that's still in 28. Um, but I just found him somehow on Instagram, like one of these moto pages I follow, printed shirts for for 28 uh, Fox Company weapons guys. So I just messaged him and I was like, what, you know, what's fuck you Fox up to? And he was like, oh shit. And then I just kind of told him, I was like, yeah, I was in, you know, 2006, 2010. And he was like, oh shit, that's badass. And he was just kind of telling me shit. And uh, it was pretty, pretty cool. Just reaching out to him. He, he seems stoked on it, but. So. so I'll speak for a second on the corner and what I do know about it. Cause I, as far as like being obsolete, I, that's news to me, but um, one thing that did happen <laughs> is that uh, like where I went through core school at up in Great Lakes, they shut that down. Oh, and moved it to um, oh, I think it's uh, Fort Sam Houston in uh, San Antonio, Texas. But what they did when they did that, this grand idea that um, the government had was let's uh, let's take the Navy corpsman the Air Force medics the, and the Army medics, and let's train them all in the same school. Oh, and then wow. the Army and Air Force will, you know, rise to the same par and caliber as Navy corpsmen. But what it did is it ended up, for lack of a better way of putting it, dumbing down the Navy corpsmen. Mm. Because what ends up happening now is out at these uh, commands that these guys will go to, is they're having to do three or four months of on the job training and like training command within the command before they're mm. ever qualified to go work in their departments. Right. So then you take individuals like that, that you send over for uh, field med training and they're just not even remotely ready. Right. Um, for, to do the job or even train for the job. So, you know, I don't know if the, they've rectified that. I know that that happened shortly after I got out. So probably we're talking like 13, 14 time frame because I got out in 12. So mm -hmm. I think it was a few years after that. Um, Dude, but, how does, let me I just, not. how does it feel like, because I obviously remember how I felt, you know, going on patrol every day and what was going on in my fucking head. What does it feel like going out? Obviously, most all of you guys, we're, we're bangers too. You know, you could, you could pop any echo silhouette, you know, just as well as, as the next guy could, but what does it feel like going out on patrol? I can't imagine that mentality that like your primary focus is just to make sure the guys don't get hurt or if they get hurt, you're going to help them. Like that's just to me, knowing you're walking out there with us and maybe not, maybe not as bloodthirsty as the rest of us were, you know, in that, in that moment. And I can't imagine what it would feel like being like my, my job is protect these guys if they get injured or like, that's just kind of a weird thing. Can you explain kind of how that feels or yeah. what you thought about? No, for me, it was a one, it was a tremendous honor to serve with you guys. Uh, it made me very proud to be in that type of unit and to have that responsibility. Because, that, you know, when we were in core school, they also, you know, like our classrooms were made up of like Navy corpsmen that were Medal of Honor recipients and, and Navy Cross recipients that served in th that type of capacity. So, yeah. you know, from the get go, we're kind of led down like this is, you know, how the profession became what it is. Um, so for me, that was one of those things that always uh, resonated with me. I always had that in my mind. And. I don't know if he ever noticed it when we lived together, but I'd be up in the middle of the night, um, like with my blanket over and my flashlight, cause I didn't want to like, you know, upset anybody. And I'd be studying my book and like, okay, if I need to put in an emergency airway, like how am I going to do that? Yeah. You know, so that I can make sure because like, first off my job, you know, y'all are telling me is to be a rifleman, but in my mind, it's also, it's like a double-edged sword. It's that, but then I also need to be ready in the capacity that I'm there for, which is to be this more yeah. medically trained person 
uh, personnel within the unit to serve as. Right. Um, and so I, that was always one of the main things when I was out there was that, you know, and especially when I was a boot on my first deployment, is like, am I going to be able to do this? You know, if I see somebody like hurt, yeah. injured, like, am I going to be able to perform? Am I going to be able to think what to do? I've ran through these scenarios constantly, drilled through them, just like y'all drilled through um, the mechanics of working as an infantry Marine and the tactics and the, and the know-how when you see something, how to react to it, same thing for us. Um, but what got me that was one of the uh, harder things to wrap my mind around was that, you know, we live, breathe, and eat with these people and they're our friends. All, you know, we're like, bro- well, we're, we're brothers, yeah. you know. And then, you know, we're seeing that and it's in a different capacity. You know, you, you just don't freeze up. Like that was yeah. my biggest fear was like, just don't freeze up. Don't mess it up. You know, do, do what you can within the scope of your practice and um, keep studying. So that well, you- I think too, obviously you were a solid ass corpsman, you know, one of the best any, any one of us could have ever wanted to be with. But I think like me and Josie talked about, like, I think sometimes those are things that, that, only come to light when you're put in situations like Certainly. that. You don't yeah. know, like you drilling that into your head, am I going to freeze up? Everybody's worried about that. But, you know, you don't really know to what level someone's going to be able to perform and do their job under those circumstances. And, you know, obviously there's a reason why guys like you and, you know, several other corpsmen in the company were regarded higher than, than others because they, you know, you, you prove you've proved that to everyone that's running. That's kind of why I was saying earlier about, you know, when you're out with a good corpsman, you feel because, you know, like, you know, that if I get clipped up or something, my chances are higher with, with having doc out, right. you know? So, but yeah, that's great. That's just crazy to me. It's, I guess, you know, until, until you, you chose that path and walked the steps that you did. You don't, I just, I just kind of shake my head about it. Cause I'm like this, these fucking guys are out here. Like they're fucking, there are doctors and they're fucking out here, like banging with us. Like, what are they doing? They're, I don't know. That, I'll that's talk on I, it a little more even um, because I was in a, the guys that were junior, like I, that came in when we did had a very unique experience because the majority of the company was all senior to us had deployed, had experience, like at least one pump under their belt. In some cases, some of them corporals and sergeants had, you know, three, four, five, six pumps under their belt. So then when I went back, or well, both of us went back in 11, it was the complete flip-flop opposite of that. You had little experience um, in the big grand scheme of things, and you had a a ton of people on their first deployment. Yeah. So... On that pump, I worked, well, I was the company corpsman for the whole workup and then for the pump. And I did a lot like what uh, Hare, Doc Hare did for the 09. Yeah. Up, attack to a squad and then rolling out every day. And um, G ran the squad. And then we had, um, oh, a couple of, a couple of uh, assault guys. And then a couple of onesies and twosies from second platoon that they plucked from each squad. And we made this month squad for squad. Yeah. <laughs> Not my squad. Actually was with us too. <laughs> and uh, I can remember like G got blown up day. And then, you know, I, everything was, ended up being fun. I had met him, medevaced him out once we got back to the fob. Um, and he, I mean, he got his, brain scrambled, you know, yeah. uh, and so from there, you know, they ended up staying at Lebanon for, I think, like three or four weeks, and so then it was just me and Prawl in the squad that had had any real, like, experience, you know, and um, I kind of studio ended up taking over you know, one of the teams then and working and running it, you know, so it was, it was almost this uh, change of position and leadership within there, of the right. dual role, but taking on that Marine team leader first and kind of backseating the corpsman, but it always still being there like right next to it. Yeah. You know, yeah. which I thought was an unbelievable opportunity. Right. 
I think yeah. too, um, it's a heck of a, a philosophy, self-aid, buddy aid, corman aid. Um, that's an interesting concept as well. But, you know, one of the things that I think also helped the company was T triple C. Oh, yeah. uh, that, that training made me that much more confident in my capability and just even like, for example, in 09 assisting Doc Smythe um, during some of those patrols, man, I think having someone who had that capacity um, behind you or in your fire team, man, was like that some serious, yeah. serious. Did you, did you get to do the TCCC before the first Afghanistan pump, the 09 one? Yeah, um, in 2008, in the wintertime, they took yeah, we did. Yeah, I did it too. We did the fucking goats, the demock with the goats. Oh, yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Did yeah. you, were you there? You were there for the goats, Herrera? I don't know if it was goats or pigs. I'm pretty sure it was pigs. We had goats. I don't know if they did it twice, but it was cold, I remember. But we did goats because they were having a pig supply issue or something. Which I know the internals on pigs are a lot, a lot closer to what you know um, humans have. But I've said that before that I, out of my entire time in the Marine Corps, that was literally the best training I ever, I ever had. Yeah, was the T Triple C and the DMOC. and it's like certain like like I mean you know doing the pigs and whatever, and of course Doc, you know this shit, but it's just like. You don't until you see something actively bleeding. That's a, a, a living thing. You don't know what that's like. I mean, and of course, some people, you know, the hunters and whatever have been experienced to shit like that before they go in. But it's a lot different when when you're perceiving it as something else, not just an animal you shot for food or whatnot. Like I got to work on this thing. Like I have to I have to stop this bleeding. And you know, when I'm stopping this bleeding, then the you know the corpsman or the trainer, whoever comes up and, and, you know, cuts its mouth open. So now it's choking on its blood and it, you know, cause it's arteries in its, in its face are choking it out. So now you got to deal with that. And then, Oh, now it's got a, you know, airway issue, a, a lung puncture. And it's just like doing those things under that kind of stress, even though it's not combat, it's like, that's invaluable training oh, yeah. that I wish more people could do. I know that's kind of like a really, touchy issue with the animals and everything i love animals you know sensitive I, I, yeah yeah but it's just like uh, that's to me really the only way you can get that close to it without without doing it feeling that warm fucking blood coming over your hands and shit and like i don't know it's just weird but like i'm i'm very very grateful that I got that opportunity. I know it wasn't a whole lot of guys got to do that in the company. Of course, the corpsmen get all that kind of shit, but, um, but as far as the, the company guys, like not many dudes got to, got to do that. Yeah. I still got, got my certification for that, man. Yeah. Yeah. I got mine up in a little binder. <laughs> I fucking love it, dude. And honestly, like I, that turned me into after that, I really kind of always was into like the medical side of it. Cause like how, kind of like you were talking about your poll, your idea for your polls and stuff around, yeah, yeah. around town. Like I was, I was always kind of like into this med, but after doing that, I just got, and then I was getting pissed off. Cause I'm like, we don't fucking have gear. I'm on eBay before we pumped in 09, buying my entire squad, fucking promise shears, all this shit, dude. I'm like, why don't we all have this? You know, it just turned me into this, this med nut. And I'm like, you know, packing out i'm carrying almost basically a whole cls bag and two different ifax on my fucking belt and shit like everybody had trauma shears everybody had extra tourniquets it was just like we got to be prepared for this shit like we don't know what we're walking into and i just love that i love that aspect of it but... oh, got a question do you have any silver bullets <laughs> did you see that did anybody see that on on veteran with a sign on instagram i don't think i saw that uh -uh. He, do you follow this guy what's the guy it's called veteran with a with a sign and he holds up uh a car a piece of cardboard like outside a base or whatever i think they're still in jacksonville i fucking sent him like three or four months ago like, you know, they just write stupid, funny quotes on cardboard and hold them up outside of base, like the the uh, <laughs> main gate. 
I sent him like three months ago, silver bullets are not bullets. And he just, <laughs> and he just post he just posted it today on his Instagram. So but, I'll look, I'll look. And anyway, it's, it's fun. Yeah. He fucking tagged me in it. I was like this, that's hilarious, but he didn't post it for a while. I was like, damn, this guy must think I'm, he might think I'm weird or something, but that's old school. Shoot, no one yeah. talks about that no more. No, I, dude, I thought that was such a weird thing in boot camp. Like you remember, I don't know how you guys did on the West coast, but in Paris Island, like we had, it was the weirdest kind of one of the culture shock things, not really culture shock, but it was weird to me because they would make us PT dog under our little skivvy shorts. And then we would wear a jock strap with no cup in it. And I'm like, why are we doing this? <laughs> and it's because if you fell out during a run or something and they had to bust that ass out in public around base <laughs> and hit you with that thing, they didn't watch your whole set hanging out. So we would wear jog straps with no cup in it, dude. Oh, shoot. Oh, oh yeah. man. That's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. Doc, Doc, did you ever have to administer a silver bullet? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's true war hero. <laughs> yeah, there's a war hero for you, <laughs> dude. I remember, and he might get mad if I say his name, but I'm gonna call him out because I love this guy. Court Courtney Hayborn was in third platoon before the uh, Iraq deployment. I think it was. Yeah, no, it was before the Afghan deployment, and uh, he was like a he case three separate times. He took that bullet, dude. Once was at Cax. Once was at Cax. Once was during a hump. I think I, he would. He could verify. We. I've joked with him so much about this, but I'm like, dog, this, this is, this is too much. Like, if you, if you swing in that way, I know we can't get into that, but stop making Doc do that to you, bro. <laughs> like, they ended up, they ended up sending him to uh, Weapons Company. He was a heavy machine gunner with Weapons Company because I guess. It's like three times if you're a heat case three times. Yeah, you can't be in the lot in the line. Put oh, yeah, and then you're more susceptible to it too. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, Polly, do you remember the first cats where Captain Gaskell made the entire company march after doing lane training all day, and then the entire company became the dying army, and like everyone got that like, was. That was the heat case that Haymore fell out on. And it once we got back to the to the case bands, Doc hit him with it. But I we that was like, wasn't that like six miles or something? It was yeah, it was far. Oh my god. That Dude, was they, and it was illegal because he got in trouble after after making us do that. Um I, dude, all I remember was like the entire platoon got split up and I kept mm -hmm. turning around, dude, and I just seen bodies. Mm -hmm. everywhere bro <laughs> and yeah. i got i got to the hooches dude in camp wilson dude and when i got in line like the like part of the platoon was there bro i just collapsed yeah and, dude yeah it was serious stuff dude man. it was yeah that was <laughs> he got in trouble for that did he get in trouble for that i'm pretty sure he did yeah he probably Basically. got his ass chewed he didn't fucking get in real net that, that, that buzz 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 light year <laughs> <laughs> Oh shit! I gotta pray for these people. <laughs> but yeah, silver bullets, dude. That's a that's pretty. Those are pretty accurate devices, though. I yeah, man. The core temperature going up. Core. That's how you're gonna get your best reading. Right, right. Oh yeah, god. Man. Luckily, I never gotten too involved with that. What I did though, help. Uh, this was yeah. This was the CACs before Iraq. I helped. Uh, Forget who the corpsmen were. Gatika, Doc Gatika. Were you there when Gatika was there? No, nah, left over. The only one that was there was uh, when I got there was Hare and Smythe and uh, Chino. Okay. Yep. Okay. They, uh, we had a guy, I ain't going to say his name because this is, we had a guy that had an abscess growing deep up into his, above his ass. I know crack. who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. And he, because he was wiping shit up his back. Like, learn how to wipe your ass, dog. Don't, you know, we're off. Don't wipe shit up your back. So he got an abscess that ended up, <laughs> got ended up rooting deep up into his back. And uh, we were getting ready. How many of y'all don't know how to do that and get those? Get what? What you're talking about, them abscesses. 
well, his got bad. And so I, I wasn't, in, I just was helping the corpsman because what happened was we ended up, we were on the way out of CACs and uh, we had all the, all the cops and stuff tipped up along the, uh, you know, the sides of the whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had a, one single cot laid out and this individual was knees in the sand of the case band bent over this cot. And my job was just to hold one butt cheek to the side. That's the only thing I was involved with. But then, and there was another Marine holding the one other cheek and doc, I think it was Gatika just lanced that thing open. Oh my God. It was the most foul smell, dude. Oh, yeah. And it was, he was just milking it out and he ended up cutting like the, the, the tip off of a IV bag and just was just flushing it out and he yeah. packed so much gauze like deep in this thing it he was in pain i felt bad for for this marine but he was in pain bad but he was like i can't he agreed to do it because he's like i can't sit on this flight all the way back to north carolina sitting on this thing like yeah. nope. but, yeah. it was a rough day for him and that whole case man smelled like death dude oh, oh and then they gotta come back man then they gotta come back <laughs> and doc and have that thing unpacked and re- oh yeah yeah he had to deal with that for a while i think because they had they have to heal from like the inside out right yeah when they, when they yeah. The, yeah so poor guy yeah dude i i give y'all props man um doc smith i feel bad for doc smith bro i got the worst like heat rash case in 09 and dude like my like general region was so inflamed. I was like, doc, what's going on? And I just kept showing him my jump, bro. And he was just like, can you just please stop showing me your jump? <laughs> <laughs> what, did you have a heat rash or something? Yeah, like really, oh, really man. bad, bro. I thought like something, like something was going on down there. And I was, it just, you know, the humidity was so damn hot in 09. Right. right. Yeah, that prickly heat and that heat, that shit's no Ooh. joke. That is the yeah. most uncomfortable. I've I've only experienced it one time, but I thought I had like fiberglass insulation dug into my back when I was like, "This is I'm oh, yeah. dying." But yeah, it sucks. Yeah, I actually. So we got back in '09 in November, and I had I had a serious skin problem, dude. It felt like all over my body, tens of thousands of needles are stabbing me every time I moved. Mm. And I went to BAS, and of course, they, they're they like, yeah, there's nothing we can do for you. And I was like, like I'm in pain. I'm, I'm seriously in pain. I ended up contacting my sister, who worked for Neiman Marcus, and she ended up sending me some, like, crazy, super expensive body lotion. And, like, two weeks later, man, my body was, like, restored. And I didn't realize that you could dehydrate your skin. I was like, so I thought that I wasn't, you know, so it was like my Mexican powers were essentially taken away from me from like all the heat and all the times that we were just out there, you know. Yeah, your skin's designed for that shit, dude. And no, it's, <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. I'm serious. <laughs> like your pigment and stuff, you're, you're built for the, for the heat and the sun, dude. Yeah, man. I don't know what happened. That's weird though. After Iraq, I had a weird skin thing and, uh, it ended up being just like a, it's called like lichen, lichen simplex, which is just a extreme like thickening of the skin, like, like eczema. When I was getting it like around my boot tops and like where my belt was on my hip and stuff. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? Go to BAS. They're like, oh, they're like, yeah, you just, <laughs> they're like, wait, wait, wait. What's the little, the phrase they use? If it's wet, if it's wet, dry it. If it's dry, wet it, right? Like yeah, moisturize yeah. dry skin. And that's all they kind of told me. And they're like, just put lotion on. I didn't go away. Got it biopsied. And they're like, oh, it's just, uh, it's just like eczema, like dry, like dry skin patches. And gave me some cream for it, and it went away. But I'm like, that shit's weird. You start thinking, you, and then you got to worry about like, I was always weird about like the, you know, not that I'm crazy like that, but like all the shots and shit we were taking in like these fucking, we yeah. would take this shit. We would take this. Uh, what was them flu shots? Where you had you had to like it wasn't it didn't have a needle on it. It was just like the syringe, and yeah, it's the, the nasal version, the nasal mist, nasal mist. And I'm like, I I don't get like I typically don't get sick hardly ever. And I'm like, I'm not fucking doing this. I'm like, doc, 
I saw, saw my name turn, look away. And I would just spray this shit over my shoulder. I'm like, I'm not doing it. Cause I don't know what's in this shit. Y'all are, te- I know you test shit out on us, dude, but not you guys, but I'm just saying the military. Yeah. But, right. yeah. Um, but yeah, I just, I'm like, you know, I didn't know what these skin things were popping up. What we, you know, Am I, am I just, dude, I remember after uh, anthrax, dude, for years after the anthrax cycles we took, I had a fucking knot in the back of my tricep for years. It wouldn't go away. And I know it that could have just been a sight reaction or whatnot, but I was like terrified about it. I'm like, is this fucking, what do I got going on? And then it finally went away, but I guess only time will tell with some of the stuff that, you know, our exposures, but. Yeah, that's a. Like uh, the mefloquine, for example, um, there's, uh, you know, for a long time, a lot of that stuff was kind of pushed away. Like it was, yeah, the VA denied it, man. Like they, they, they said that, you know, we were never given that stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and we were, it was crazy because for seven months, man, I had the craziest vivid dreams of my oh, entire dude. family burning alive for seven oh, months. Scary. Yeah. Dude, the thing, and I feel like something's wrong with me, and this ain't that funny, really. It's kind of gross, but, like, I a lot of guys I knew had bad nightmares, night terrors on this shit. I fucking love taking this mefloquine, dude, because I would have the most, you know, it was erotic, dude. Almost every time I would take this pill, vivid, like, night dream. And I'm like, you're in Afghanistan, ain't nothing around. I'm like, I'm thinking this is real life. I'm having these great dreams and shit, but yeah, never had a bad, ex- I never had a bad a dream or experience with that, but it would be the craziest vivid, like real life dreams. They just weren't bad, but yeah. obviously the side effects to that. I think I had a real problem when I got back come like coming off of that or, or, you know, just the effects from it, because I, I'm sure there was a whole different type of adjusting going on, but I think that that mefloquine, like for that first year, like I was like a very angry individual. And I mean, it could have been other things, but I feel like that definitely had something to do with it. Knowing what we know now about it, this blacklisted and. Yeah. um, So so doc, the last time I saw you, I think was uh, when Semper Fi Deller, remember Deller? Yeah. Yeah. And she came and y'all guys. Yeah, I was out. thinking about that. Yeah. Um, I went out and got a beer, I think, somewhere. Got dinner or something. Or... Yeah, we went downtown. We went to uh, the bar is no longer there, I think, but it was like uh, level five. It was oh, a okay. rooftop bar. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, how do you hygiene that brain of yours these days? <laughs> Well, so how do I hygiene my brain? Man, I unpack things. Um, it's been a process, okay? So, like, it wasn't good when I first got out, man, uh, as all of us experience, you know, um, or most of us, I should say. Uh, y'all really hit on it the last discussion you had was um, – the lack of purpose. And for me, that was the biggest thing was the lack of purpose. And um, really what's kept me grounded is my children. And at the time when I got out, I only had my daughter, um, but she was really the, the grounding factor that gave me, you know, whenever I was really feeling bad or couldn't figure things out, I always would say to myself, well, there's one thing, you know, that you can't ever take away from me. And it's, I'm never going to, like not going to be a good dad to this little girl. That's one thing that I can always say that I did and was successful at. Um, and I would kind of always come back to that to keep myself grounded. Um, but I, truth be told, I, I almost shot myself in 2013 and I voluntarily put myself into a, um, a facility for a few days to get everything under control. Um, and then, you know, I've been in and out of therapy for pretty much since then. Um, but now everything's like managed really well because I know how to do it. I know how to manage myself. And um, the other big thing is to continue to exercise. So I walk, I hike the trails. I just do my calisthenics. 
And then um, I always keep pressing forward too. You know, I get I get bored. My brain gets bored if I get into the same routine or, or the too much. And so, um, kind of before we started, I uh, mentioned that I was in nursing school now, and yeah. so that was something that you know I kind of always wanted to get back into healthcare, but I also kind of like never really wanted to take the step. So I would kind of self sabotage. So I never actually had to get back into it. But in my mind, it would make up an excuse that, you know, some other external factor was the reason why I couldn't press forward. Um, but then after my divorce, you know, I, I obviously had a little more um, eye opening and soul searching that happened within that whole process, too. And I uh, just made the made the call one day and made the decision. No, this is where I need to be and this is what I need to do. Um, and it's it's not easy but I keep growing and keep moving forward uh, um, and gaining more perspective and purpose as I do that. I learn more about myself and then um, it's a challenge. You know, it's not like pounding the ground or, you know, trying to hang with the, the, the big dogs and the heavy hitters out there, but instead it's more like, what can I do up here and what can I unwind and pound through up here? You know, I find myself in the up studying for this stuff, you know, spending like more than eight hours a day doing this just to make sure that I get through and I score the best that I can, you know, and I mean, as it sits now, I sit at the top, you know, right at the top of my class with like one other girl, you know, um, we kind of run the show, if you will. And so, you know, that, that I'm not surprised about that. (laughs) (laughs) If for real, that's awesome, dude. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Um, but that, uh, that's how I do it. Um, and of course, there's a lot more that I have behind the scenes too that I constantly work on. Um, you know, mental health is a big thing for us and our community. And uh, I re- definitely appreciate the approach that you take, Jose, because it, um, there's a greater perspective that needs to be gained, um, that needs to change the trajectory of the future. But I, I personally also feel like there's also in the moment, and for me, where I fit in best is to help with the moment, because there's a lot of us now that it's the damage is already done. So something has to be done there too. It's, it's a multi-factorial process that has to be attacked from multiple angles. And so like kind of where I hone in on um, is a combination of uh, drug therapy and then psychotherapy, because that's kind of been a big uh, dispute and process within the medical community. You know, like we're all familiar with, you go to the VA and, oh, I feel sad. I feel unhappy. I want to blow my brains out. And I'm like, okay, here, take these pills and you'll feel better. Well, the problem with that and not coupling it with a therapist that works, a lot of these drugs that they give you within the first month, you know, this one of the most common side effects is increased in suicidal ideations. Well, if the yeah. guy's already suicidal and then you're giving him drugs to make him more suicidal and you don't have him hooked up with a therapist that he feels that he can talk to, yeah. you're setting these individuals up for failure, in my opinion. So, the, you know, that's kind of the angle that I, um, where I found my niche to, to help and try to bring a different perspective to light within the community. Um, and that's one thing that keeps me grounded and focused and how I keep myself uh, on the straightened path and straight and narrow. And it's not easy. You know, I still get sad. I still find myself like just triggered sometimes driving down the road. And then I find myself like with tears rolling down my face. I'm like, why is this even happening? Like, why do I, you know, this is so stupid. But then I just kind of eat it up, suck it up, say, it's okay. You're good and allow it to happen and move on, you know, but I wouldn't do that before. Be like, oh, you're yeah. close to, you can't do that. You can't let people know that. So for me, it also helps to talk about it and talk about it with the guys. And I know a lot of people have this perspective of military people that if they speak on their experiences, somehow they're fabricating it. And, you know, like if they don't talk about it, then that means they really saw shit and did shit. But I know from a personal 
for me, if I feel comfortable with the individual and that they're not going to cast that judgment, I'm probably going to go ahead and talk about some of the experiences, maybe not the gory details of it all, but the emotional experiences that I felt through it. Um, and it, and it helps me and it helps me build relationships with people that were non-military and have no experience because that was also a, a big issue is like, I just felt like this freaking weirdo in the world, like unable to connect to people. Um, but as I went through therapy and talked it out with my therapist, she was awesome for me. I still see her, see her maybe like three times a year now. Um, almost like a, like a wellness check with your doctor. And that, you know, that works for me. Um, but she, she was able to get me to break down these walls to, to break down that tough guy persona, to break down that battlefield mindset where, you know, yeah, that was practical and useful on the battlefield, but back here in your interpersonal relationships with your, your friends and your coworkers, that's not practical, not practical to, you know, um, bow up on people or project on them that you, you know, are just a bigger and badder version than anybody they've ever met or encountered. So that's, uh, that's kind of what I, how I take, uh, take it each day. Hell yeah, dude. Glad to hear you're, you're back into medical stuff, man. I think that's where you belong. I definitely feel like you can probably, you know, pursue whether you, I don't know what you want to do with that. I can unpack that a little bit for you. Yeah. So Please. right now, you know, my current, I'm in uh, school to get my nursing degree and I'll finish that in about, um, oh, 10, 10, 11 months or so. And uh, then I'm going to, I got to work for a little bit to get some experience. I'm going to apply to go to nurse practitioner school after that. Nice. So in the state of Florida, you can be an independent licensed um, prescriber and uh, provider. So you could open up your own, I mean, you can operate just like a physician uh, right. to that level. And so kind of what I focus on initially is working within all populations and probably more so along the lines of um, family medicine and emergency medicine. And then after I gained some experience within the civilian world and practicing medicine a little bit and like get back into it, mm -hmm. I plan to move more into the psychiatry and therapeutic aspects of it. And then, you know, kind of along the way the whole time in the, in the background, you know, like, move forward with some different therapies that uh, are a little more taboo to the medical community. Um, but we, you know, some of the things that they do right now is they do like for treatment resistant PTSD, they utilize ketamine therapy sessions, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, a lot of people don't really look at it as a, as the, a viable option, but it, but it is, you know, it happens and it helps stimulate the proteins within your brain that to make new neural, the, the neuronal connections. Mm -hmm. We administer this, we discuss these past experiences and the new ways to cope with it. And now hopefully we can rewire and train you to understand the new coping mechanisms and that we can flush the other things away. Yeah. Flush away the depressive symptoms and the anxiety, or at least mitigate them. We know they're always going to be there but where they don't consume the patient. So yeah, awesome. microdosing therapies are, are pretty, pretty radical, man. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been like, for me, like, I don't, I can't do it. I've, it's been suggested, Hey, Jose, go try this out. And I want to, I just have this lingering fear about what happens if I go down that rabbit hole and I don't come back with my mind. Sure. You know what I'm saying? So that's one of the, that's one of my biggest fears too. It's very difficult for me to kind of let, you know, let go of myself. Yeah. And a lot of those things will, will force you to do that pretty much. Um, which I know that's why they're therapeutic, but I have just this fear of that. Like, 
I don't want to say I'm a controlling person, but I like being in control of, of myself. Um, it's your ego. Yeah. Yeah. You have to experience ego death, like truthfully. Right. Um, where you have, we have to be able to let go. Um, but there are new things that can be learned from that, you know, and, and it's, it's an interesting, like, like Jose was saying, a, a radical, um, the micro dosing, cause they, they're working with MDMA right now doing the same thing. And it's actually in phase three. So the next phase will be, you know, review for FDA approval. Yeah. And what I think, I think it comes to the individual, you know, you two seem pretty grounded. You're not in these crisis situations or it hasn't been lingering maybe and going on for, you know, a year or two years, five years, 10 years, you know, where we need to undo that, where you've tried everything under the sun and just things aren't getting better. Mm -hmm. I think it, you, you get some of those people that get to that point and it's like, well, what else does, what else do I have to lose at this point? And yeah. so able to let go of that ego, utilize this, and learn something from it. Um, and in a controlled environment that's been, you know, rigorously tested with imperial results to back it up, I, you know, it's something that I'm for because I just don't think that the current stat quo is doing it well enough. True. I agree a hundred percent. And I know that, you know, that stuff's effective just from what I've seen and, and read about it, you know, with the mushrooms and, you know, marijuana even, and, you know, a lot of, a lot of different tools, all these things. I was talking to a ranger buddy of mine and a lot of, you know, everything's a tool, you know, it depends on how you use it and there's, there's goods and bads with, with all of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, if anybody can get help from it, you know, and you can help, help them show them that that's awesome. Yeah. Unfortunately, we've, we screwed the, we screwed the industry in my opinion on, on this, on me using that for medicine. Um, Cause most people don't know that I also for a time worked for the largest medical marijuana company in the state of Florida. And I worked in their lab making their products and what they've done with that industry is that they've put it on ballots for the states to vote and they didn't put it through these rigorous testing and trials. They did that after the fact and it hasn't get, haven't put it through the FDA approval process. Mm -hmm. What it's done is it's turned into a recreational market market right. with additional face on it. You can't go into one store like we'll use Colorado, for example, you can't go to the recreational store on the corner here and buy the same product that's in the medicinal store over on this corner with a different wrapper on it, but right. by the same facility. And that's what they're doing. So it, it negates it. It makes it where it's not a viable option anymore. And it doesn't develop it because we're not focusing on practical uses for it. We're focusing on how much money can we make? Real yeah. So I've kind of written that one off. Right. Yep. Yeah, man, that's uh, <laughs> that's some wild stuff. Um, when I when I hear you talk about that, I think about like Empire Support, for example, um, and the resilience training that I do. <clears throat> that crisis, crisis now, help me now. I think is a critical moment. And I think too, like if you were to take the analogy of a guy who gets continuous heat cases, you know, he becomes more and more susceptible to it. I think those, those kinds of crisis now where a person goes through that and they put them in a hospital or they put them in a situation and then there's no follow through afterwards, that increase in, I don't want to call it a relapse, you know, but just that crisis moment, it just becomes a kind of gateway or a conduit to just a state where at some point the individual just ain't going to come back. And, you know, for one, I know the power of how specific kinds of drugs, like, for example, I worked at a, at a wet shelter for a period of time, I think it was like a year and like two months and the wet shelter and it's, it was a homeless shelter, but they called it a wet shelter because, you know, guys that were coming out of jail or were court ordered there or like dudes that were like legitimately homeless were able to use 
you know, their substances, you know, and I couldn't turn somebody away, you know, if they had been using heroin and I, I, you know, there was guys that would talk to me, they would like literally fall asleep as I'm talking to them, just trying to get them through the doorway. Yeah, Yeah, man. And on multiple occasions, you know, guys would OD uh, at night and, you know, we couldn't administer the, the naloxone uh, to these guys, but the paramedics, whenever, you know, would call them up, they could do it. And I know that, you know, a guy ODing on heroin is a little bit different from a guy in a crisis moment, you know, mental health. But, you know, the, the fact is they brought him back for that moment of clarity to save his life. And so I see the value in all of that. I think long term wise, you know, creating these kind of hyper types of programs that incorporate the follow through like peer support. And, and, and I think the VA is now taking that approach. They call it like pack teams. And it's like, you have your physician, they have your uh, therapist, then they have your peer support specialist who follows through with you. And it just creates this uh, more impactful, meaningful uh, experience as you're coming out of that kind of like shadow. And, you know, long-term wise, I think a lot of this has to deal with um, how we perceive information, how it's being delivered to us. So, for example, not only is this a psychological problem, but it's also a philosophical problem. And I always say this to, to people that, you know, I talk about, you know, these mental health models is that imagine seeing a patient every day who's had an opioid problem. And imagine you give this person you know, the safe space, the kinds of strategies to, so that he could kind of, or he or she can fulfill, but then you have to send them back into the same toxic environment, the same zones, and the relapse rate is even higher. And so that's kind of what's happening now with these kind of traditional models of therapy is that the world has rapidly changed uh, because the technologies, because the way influence is being used against us that now all of a sudden any traditional model of therapy has become kind of inert. It's not effective. And so we have to change like the whole of society and it has to, it has to be a bottom up process and a top down process. And that's kind of, you know, one of the directives of doing this book and having guys come forward is because there needs to be an authoritative uh, voice to establish that. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems that I faced when I got out back in 2011 was everyone kept telling me what was wrong with me and not listening to what I had to say. Like, oh, you got a moral injury. Oh, you have PTSD. Oh, you have this. Oh, you have that. And that's like, I just want somebody I could talk to to share what's going on in my head. I don't, I'm, I don't want to be diagnosed with anything. I just need somebody to talk to. And, you know, when I did share, it was like people weren't listening. Uh, They were just trying to come up with a response to diagnose me on the spot. And I was like, no, 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 that's not it. And so I think that's kind of one of the steps that we have to take as an organization or as a community by saying, look, these are the facts. These are the complex facts. This is what has worked for a group of individuals. This could possibly work for you. And I think that's one of the, you know, that's, God, what more could you ask for? And I think that it's time that this community co-ops this narrative, this kind of like victimization or this kind of demasculinization of this, you know, society that has answered the nation's call and then has come back to once again, fulfill the role of whatever America's needs are. Yeah. Yeah, dude, for sure. I understand. Kind of like I said that, you know, in the last, last time we talked, it's just, I think it's, su- it is such an individual um, thing as far as, you know, processing similar, like the situations we, we all went through, you know, one guy might react, a certain way to certain treatment one guy might have complete adverse adverse effects to that same treatment i mean it's it's all it's all dependent on on the individual but it doesn't mean that you can't just like you just said and kind of what i said the last time about 
you know, we were talking about getting, just getting prescribed medication and being sent on your way. Like I said, I'm not saying the medication is not effective. It's, it's how are you monitoring how this person's doing while they're using what you're giving them? Um, you know, but just saying, Oh, yep, here, take this, you know, hope, hope you feel better. And it could be, and it, and it might not be like the VA not attempting to set this individual up with a therapist or something. It could be on that veteran, not wanting it, you know, be involved in that way or whatnot. It's not, it, that's why it's just such a, a, a difficult situation. Cause there's so many different avenues on all of the different things. Like you said, the peer support thing, just talking about it, just going to a group, maybe no medication at all is involved or no microdose and treatments or anything like that. It's just, just saying how you feel, knowing that you're not going to be judged by anyone um, that you're speaking with. And that, that has huge benefits, you know, in itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, something, obviously you got, you know, you guys, the way the things that you've done and obviously doc your plans on what you want to do. I mean, that's, that's just killer to know that you guys are still decade after everything or got your feet under you. And you're like, okay, I, I do have the tools and the ability to, to do something about this and what I see might be effective. Um, I just think that's, that's awesome. Oh. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just changing the fabric, you know. It's the the whole way we practice, whether it is um, as a group at the at the level with within the unit, um, because the, there's a few things too that, that come into play with it that you can't have everybody quitting and you know hurting in the middle of it either, because that's not effective in order to accomplish the mission. But mm -hmm. after the fact, and you know, these guys um, decide, oh, yep, I'm gonna exit the service. There has to be some sort of system there in place to retrain um, on how to, how to cope with life and how to do things. Yeah. Because they do that for three, four, five, six months when you get in before they send you to the unit. Right. But then on the back side, they just leave it two weeks, you know, exit training for you. Here's, you know, a bunch of websites and phone numbers to call and good luck. Thanks for your service. Yeah. And that's an interesting point too. I mean, like you see, you know, a lot of guys that I've, that I've talked to or, or, you know, several guys have been like, you know, that transition period is very, you know, very difficult for a lot of people, but there's a common thread that most combat vets are like, just send me back there because life was easier there. Yeah. It was simple. I knew my job. I knew my mission. It was a routine. And I mean, routine breaking and, and building routines is a very difficult thing in itself. Like habits and habit, habit forming behaviors are very difficult to break and, you know, learn, learn new ones. Um, but I think that's transitioning. That's a very difficult thing. You don't, a lot of that goes with purpose too, but it's like, you know, you knew, you knew, for four, at least four years or six years or how, you know, however, however long you're in for, you know, on a daily basis, when you go to bed, this is what I'm going to do. The events might unfold differently each day, but you knew what was in front of you pretty much. Um, the unknown is, is, has a, has a weird way of, of twisting people up. And I think as a civilian departing from, from, something like that, like you're saying, without a proper, you know, um, kind of after action on the thing where you're, you're kind of redeveloped into a, uh, competent civilian again, and not some warrior, like that could, could pay huge dividends. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely need something like that. Cause you can't just literally sign a paper once you get that paper signed it's just like oh, drive off base and then you could have i mean like you said you were home Herrera. you were home for what like a month before you were getting out you didn't even know how to check out properly and like where yeah. to go literally just back from from combat in a month and then this guy is out on the streets and everything that he just left is like complete 180 from what he's walking into you know, that shouldn't happen that way. Um, there's gotta be, yeah, there's just gotta be. And I mean, it's in two, you're talking about like, like 
her, like you said the last time, like you're talking about keeping a unit of guys together for eight, 10 years, whatever it is, like minimum enlistment with your corpsman training, with our infantry training, like by the time you get to a unit, how fucking much time of training have you already been through before you can even be effective at your job? Like you're looking, you're pushing into almost two full years of your contract, most, most likely before you're an effective contributing member. I mean, I know the SF teams do really in-depth, you know, training before they even determine these guys to be contributors and, and be on teams. But, you know, you go, you're going through that much time then you pump out, you do your, and then you can literally get out, but there's no, maybe tack another year on it. Say, look, that last six months, like you were saying, you gotta, you gotta go through this exit process where you, you're going to classes and shit, just like we all had to go to classes all the time to learn our job, learn how, you know, yeah, there's a, learn how to be, learn how to be what you were before. Is, yeah. Instead of, instead of hiring on, um civilian contractors to do half of these jobs and maintain bases why not have the guys transitioning that are doing that now you get to right. a nine to five job in a civilian role and learn what it's like to do that again yeah but yeah. instead we hire it out to other people to do it. that was you know. yeah i agree with that and especially uh, sorry to cut in here no, 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 especially ahead, guys would come from combat roles Guys coming from combat roles, you don't have a, a particular skill set apart from, you know, applying war fighting strategies. That's all you know. So you come out and unless you have some type of talent or skill before going to college, you can't immediately enter the workforce. You know, like you just said, train guys up. You're contracting a ton of civilians. I'm sure they would be more than willing to hire you on. And maybe it could be kind of like a, I don't want to call it like a halfway house, but like a you're still in the military, but you're you're hired on by a civilian company too. Like an apprenticeship and or something. Exactly. These guys are going to train you to learn a skill that you're interested in, learn how to weld, do construction, whatever you want, culinary stuff, whatever it is. And now you got a civilian skill set that's going to help you out in life if you don't plan to go to college or advance your, you know, your your schooling. Um that's all. That's an awesome idea. Because there was a there was a science fiction piece that I wrote, um, and and this is this is this is more of a vision that I have with the O thirty three program that I want to approach. You know, DOD with or the Marine Corps with, and the O thirty three program is having a mental uh, an actual rifleman that's well versed, well indoctrinated, has the certifications to not only apply. Uh, rifleman skills, but also the mental health capabilities to administer peer support um, with some of the models and paradigms that I have in order to keep these guys in top shape um, so that they're not going through some of the things that we went through. Um, but one of the other aspects of it was I wanted to create no shit bona fide um, centers of excellences specifically per unit. So imagine having a Victor 208 Center of Excellence that has all the workforce development capabilities that is able to teach classes that talk about the philosophical components, the kinds of memes or the kinds of cultural uh, bits of information that linger within a warrior society that do have some effect on us after service, right? So we discussed the Hagakure portion where you know, according to the samurai, the way was found through death, right? That has a psychophysiological aspect and effect on us after we leave, because it's easier to think death, right? Having like, you know, like, for example, I remember I was haunted, man, every morning that I would wake up, like at three in the morning, take a shower. And the first thing in my head was suicide, bro. Like, for years and years. And I was like, why is this happening? And then I began to dissect why I thought that. Way. And it was because I was institutionalized to think, you know, when you step beyond the line of departure, you're as good as dead. And it's either you go 100%. And so death was this kind of like mean plex, this programming 
that was always, you know, alive in my life. And so it was constantly there. And it took me a little bit to finally overcome it, but I did. I did it with, you know, some of the models and some therapies, some EMDR and some aromatherapy. And I created a new kind of, you know, neural pathway to allow that not to affect me. But two, in a practical level, um, have a good friend. His name is Robert Elliott. He started a, a program, um, well, several programs. One of them was the, the Veterans Farm of North Carolina. Then he, he did a, a deal with Fort Bragg and he teaches what's called the Soldier to Agriculture Program. And what he does is people who are transitioning or people who go to NC State that want to participate and try to learn how to, you know, get involved with uh, agriculture, you know, they teach that on base. And he's creating a follow on uh, program where guys and girls or whomever wants to take this, you know, agriculture and turn it into a business and provide the American infrastructure with some, you know, some strong farmers. Um, he's going to put them through this program and then he's going to, you know, wherever they want to grow, whatever niche product they want to, you know, create, they can do it. And, you know, I'm a huge, you know, I'm a huge advocator and a huge firm believer that that is the kind of implementations that we need in order to keep a strong um, uh, uh, body population, a citizen base and an operating force. We need those components. And I think, too, that these kinds of components need to be integrated within everyday life. Like, for example, Every barrack should have a bona fide freaking community garden. You know what I'm saying? Every every freaking barrack should have PMEs aside your MOS skills, talking about philosophy, talking about religion, talking about culture, expanding the creativity process, not just by saying, hey, you're going to go freaking, you know, shoot and maneuver. Or, kill, kill, kill. Yeah. And while I think on a small minor scale, these things are happening, we have to take these, these kinds of models into greater length. And we have to be radical with the way we approach it. Dude, you, war and warfare is a very human and intimate aspect of our everyday life. And we should be treating it as such if we're going to train young minds into these kinds of roles which do get entangled into our identities we have to approach it as such i just wanted to share that with y'all man because that's exactly i think the way this overall community should be going and once again you know i'm not trying to be a savior or anything like that it just it's time to do some advocating for the boys and and now you know our sisters who who are entering those kinds of roles which is is a is an interesting dynamic in itself. For sure. Yeah. You know, it only, it makes me think about, you know, uh, kind of what you said, Herrera, about, you know, Phil, I don't know a ton about your, you know, your upbringing or anything, but, you know, Herrera, the things you went through growing up, like it makes you wonder, you know, before you join the service to do that type of job that, you know, we were, we were called to do or chose to do, you know, I think those lessons you learned in life prior to service, you know, definitely, definitely helped you through difficult times, difficult situations. It makes me wonder now, like how, how kids these days, you know, just how, how dumbed down they are really by their, by their devices that we didn't really have. You know, I didn't have, so I didn't have like video games growing up, but it wasn't like it was now where you, you can sit there on your phone 24 seven and just, let this thing suck your life away. Like you're outside, you're getting banged up. You're, you're living. So when you enter service and you're abusing your body and doing all these things to it, you're kind of used to that. Like, I can't imagine now kids, kids nowadays with all their devices and all their, all their things that are just sucking their life away, going into the Marine Corps, being sent to war, like, how mentally tough can they be? How physically tough can they be? If they're exposed to trauma at, at a high level, how, what is that going to be like for them? Because, you know, 
I know, and I know not every kid lives that type of lifestyle that I'm describing here, but I just, I just feel like that would be extremely more difficult for them to experience some of the stuff that we did and then get out and be, you know, live a full life. And, and I think that would be a lot more damaging to them mentally, at least. Um, just because some of those tough life lessons that, that you went through and, and people do go through, they, they didn't have them. Um, I don't know. It's, it's very interesting to see, to see how, how it, how it plays out. I mean, and what kind of kids like who do, do, do kids these days, do 18, 19 year olds even want to join the military? I don't, I don't know a ton of them obviously, but, uh, I don't know if they do or not. You should go to, go to a high school and take a poll or something to be like, Hey, you ever thought about the service? I'm not a recruiter. I'm just asking questions. I don't think they do. I don't, I don't think they're for the most part. I don't know. It's a select few. Bro. Yeah. It's gotta be the past seven years that I've been working with uh, young, uh, you know, uh, youth and teenagers, man, a lot of them. And I mean, a lot of them first thing out of their mouth, I don't want to die. You know, and yeah. part of that is this, you know, this, this idea of the spectacle that is initiated by Hollywood and the media yeah. where we normalize the intimacy of war and we turn it into a game. And then, you know, whenever it's time to do these things, every, every attempt to try to salvage, uh, you know, what's left of a human being is in vain because they weren't prepared. They weren't ready for the rigors of something so primal. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, once again, you know, it's not, it's not just so much even go entering service. It's, it's so much like, what does it mean to be a good citizen? What does it mean to have strong relationships with your fellow countrymen and fellow country women? And if you're not within the mindset that everything that you do has some effect, some second, third, fourth, fifth order effect within your community or within your current area, you're, you're not going to contribute to progress, to, to development. And once again, we're going to enter some serious declines. And it, and you know how that story goes, man. Uh, it's, a, it's an ugly story. Yeah, it's very concerning. Well, well, let's end on a on a better note. For you know, there is hope, man. Um, you know, I, I've said it time and time and again. I'm probably too stupid to quit. You know what I'm saying? Like until my dying breath, man. It's what do I got to lose? What That's do right. I got to lose? You know, they've. You know, I. You know, the way I grew up the way I was trained, all the shit that we went through, like there's specific people that can carry that burden. And so, you know, that's, if there's anything I can share is, is that sense of security that, you know, Herrera has got some fucking fight left and it's fucking go time. Oh yeah, yeah man, for sure. Good shit, brother. So, uh, man, once again, man, I appreciate you fellas coming on, man. Sharing. Hell yeah, appreciate you having me. Good to see you, Doc. Yeah.